Thank you. Here's the book. There's the picture of it. It's really a pleasure to be here. I've had a wonderful time driving around the roads of Orange County from the airport to get here. You guys live in a wonderful, wonderful area. I was in New York this morning on the streets of New York City, and I want to tell you, they don't look like <laughs> this area. <laughs> so uh, you ought to be very happy you live in a, in a place that seems to be orderly and clean and neat. Few, there are some traffic jams, but it, it was a great trip here from the airport. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about um, this book. This is a, uh, a book about the financial crisis, and, uh, and my um, service on something called the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission that was appointed by um, Congress, not appointed by the President, it was appointed by Congress for the purpose of telling the American people, telling Congress, and telling the President uh, what caused the terrible financial crisis that we had in, in 2008. Um, unfortunately, I have to report that they didn't do a very good job. In fact, um, they didn't do a job at all, at least uh, by any current understanding of what a job is. Um, they wasted a lot of government money and produced a report that was fundamentally, I thought, for the purpose of supporting um, Nancy Pelosi's idea of what kind of regulation ought to be put in place as a result of the financial crisis. So I dissented from the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, and uh, my dissent was actually almost 100 pages, um, and the report was about 550 pages. If you bought the, if you bought the report in, in a store, there was a commercial edition of it. My dissent was only nine pages. They had managed um, not to publish my entire dissent in the commercial edition, but if you bought the version that was put out by the government printing office, um, that did have my full dissent. But in any event, after this service, I went back and found as much of the uh, information that the, that the commission had acquired during its almost three years in existence. And I wrote the book based on my dissent, but with a lot of information that I never even saw when I was a member of the commission. Because the idea of the commission was not, unfortunately, to <laughs> really tell the American people what actually happened, but to provide the foundation, I think, for what ultimately we had, uh, what, what ultimately Congress did, and that is something called the Dodd-Frank Act, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Well, let's get started a little bit. Okay. Let me see if I have this right. Maybe I'm... Okay. Um, most of you, if you read the papers, you watch television, hear the radio, you have an idea about what caused the financial crisis that is probably wrong. Um, you've been told, we've all been told, that the financial crisis was caused by insufficient regulation of the private sector. Um, and that uh, as a result of that insufficient regulation, it was necessary for us to adopt much tougher regulations for, for the financial system as a whole. Now, that analysis, as I suggested, is wrong. It is what I call a false narrative about the financial crisis because the facts tell a completely different story, and this, what you see on the screen here, is the basic fact. If there's no other fact that you remember from what I'm going to say tonight, this is the basic fact that you ought to keep in mind. On the left um, are the mortgages that were held. The, these are the subprime, low-quality, risky mortgages um, that were held by the government in 2008. In 2008, more than half of all mortgages in the U.S. financial system were subprime or otherwise low quality and very risky. They were made to people who did not have good credit. Uh, they were made to people who didn't have adequate down payments. Um, 
but more than half of all mortgages were made to, of, of that kind. Of those, and there were about 31 million such mortgages, of those, 76% were on the books of government agencies. So on the left is a, a little figure that shows the government's holdings of those low quality mortgages. The blue were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, two government backed companies that were dominating the mortgage system and had for many years. A little bit above that, the red is uh, the Federal Housing Administration, which is another government agency that was engaged in housing finance. And at the top, there were several different agencies in the green that um, like the VA and, and uh, the Agriculture Department, all of which had something to do with housing for specialized groups. But if you just looked at that, you could understand who actually created the demand for the mortgages that were the ultimate cause of the financial crisis. Seventy-six percent of all those bad mortgages were on the books of government agencies. 24% is the black, and that's the private sector. So to blame the financial crisis on the private sector takes some doing. I mean, you really have to ignore an awful lot of information in order to make that case, but that's what the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission did. Now, this is a, a, a truncation of shortening down of, just to show you, a little bit more about this Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission because you will hear a lot about it. People will say, oh, well, you know, there was this report, this official government organization that made a report and they said it was the private sector that did it and that's why we have this law, this Dodd-Frank Act, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Well, this is a truncation, um, a shortening down of a document that was published by Fannie Mae one of those two very large government agencies, in 2009. Now, Fannie Mae became insolvent in 2008 at the time of the crisis, and it and its corresponding sort of competitive sister, if you will, Freddie Mac, um, both were engaged in the same business. Both of them became insolvent at the same time, but Fannie Mae reported this in 2009, after the government had taken it over. One of the reasons it's important that the government had taken it over is that before that they weren't reporting these things. People actually didn't have the information that this shows. But if you look at the, it used to be yellow, but whatever that color is, the colored section, um, that shows the bad mortgages that Fannie was holding at the time in 2008. And you'll see on the extreme right-hand side, they were holding $837 billion worth of those mortgages. And then just below that, the 81.3 number, that's 81.3%, and that was their losses. 81.3% of their losses came from these $837 billion in low quality mortgages that they held. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is that this was not in the report of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission was appointed in 2009. They were there through 2009, 2010, and finally reported in 2011. This data was never in the report. So they never showed anyone the fact that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac held all these low quality mortgages. In fact, they said that Fannie and Freddie, which were backed by the government and regulated by the government and, were, and did what the government told them to do, um, they s described Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as marginal to what happened in the financial crisis, whereas they were central. Okay, why is it that we are really interested in this subject today? I mean, a lot of people would say, well, who cares now? I mean, it's all over. The crisis is passed. Um, we adopted some new legislation, and so everything is being taken care of now. Why are you bothering us to talk about this financial crisis, which is history? It's not anything that affects our lives today. What you see here is a um, 
graph that was put out by one of the Federal Reserve Banks. This is the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And the black line in the shaded area is the recoveries that we have had in the past from financial crises and recessions. The shaded area is the average. Uh, the shaded area is all recoveries since, since the mid-1960s. And the black line is the average of all of them. The red line, I think it's still red on this, um, the red line is the recovery we have had from the most recent financial crisis. And so one of the points I try to make is that we have this very, very slow recovery, slower by a vast margin any other recovery we've had because of the adoption of the Dodd-Frank Act, which was adopted by Congress in 2010 after the financial crisis as the um, cure, the remedy for what they said was the cause of the crisis, which was excess, uh, insufficient regulation of the private sector. So that's one of the reasons why it's important for every, everyone in America to understand why we've had such a, a slow recovery. We've had a slow recovery because of the Dodd-Frank Act, and that's why there's so much unemployment. That's why middle class incomes have been stagnant. That's why the, the banks are, are offering 1% or less in the way of um, uh, interest rates on deposits. All of those things come from the fact that this Dodd-Frank Act has made it extremely difficult for businesses to get credit and for the economy to grow. So that's one reason why I'm talking to you now about why we ought to understand this, because if we are ever going to have a recovery in this country of the kind that we are accustomed to, and as many of you know, in the Reagan period, we had, we had 7 and 8 percent growth in some quarters. Here we've ha had an average of about 2 percent growth since the financial crisis. It's all because of this Dodd-Frank Act. So I want the American people, to the extent I have a chance to talk to them, to understand why we are in this position, and it's because we have the wrong view of what caused the crisis. It was not a lack of regulation of Wall Street and f the financial system. It was government housing policies. The second point that I think is important to understand is as long as we continue to believe that it was insufficient regulation of the financial system that caused the financial crisis, well, we're not paying any attention to what the government is doing. Um, we American people believe, and many of the people in Washington are saying, well, we passed this Dodd-Frank Act, now we don't have anything to worry about, there won't be any more crises, it's all taken care of, but in fact, what is happening is that the government is doing exactly the same thing right now that it was doing leading up to the financial crisis because no one understands what actually caused the financial crisis. What is it doing? It is reducing underwriting standards for mortgages and homes. And I'll get to that in a minute to show you exactly how that happened. Um, here's, here's where we get we start talking about that subject. And I know it's not the juiciest thing you have all encountered, but it's, it's very important to understand. It's, underst it's important to understand it because everyone who owns a home uh, and has a mortgage, um, is, you're all in the same boat. Um, if your neighbor defaults on his car loan, it doesn't affect you at all. Now, you ha might have to drive him to work, but, but other than that, it doesn't affect you. If your neighbor defaults on his mortgage, it affects you very directly because every house in the neighborhood is then reduced in value because of that default. Everyone knows that because when, a comp when, when a, the appraisers go through and they do the comparables, which they do, they find this house that looks just like your house except that someone is willing to sell it for two-thirds of the price 
um, that you thought you could get for your house. And that drives down the value of your house. So uh, the American people should understand from the beginning that they all have a stake if they are homeowners. Not just as taxpayers, because of course the taxpayers had to pay up a lot um, because of the losses of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, had to bail them out, are still bailing them out. Um, but it's not just the taxpayers, it's everyone who owns a home has to be sure that everyone else who owns a home can afford to carry that home. In other words, was a good credit when he or she bought the home. Now what you're seeing up here is something called the Affordable Housing Goals, which were adopted in 1992 by the US Congress. They were applied to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, who were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? I mentioned to you that they were the dominant players in the US housing market, but there's more than that. They were backed by the government. The market understood that if they ever failed, the government would come in and save all their creditors, and it did in 2008. Um, but in addition, they were regulated by the government. And in 1992, the government imposed on them something called the Affordable Housing Goals. Now, before those goals were imposed on Fannie and Freddie, um, they accepted only prime mortgages. What was a prime mortgage? A prime mortgage at the time, and still is today, um, someone is made to someone who has a good credit score, a good credit record. Uh, the number isn't really important, just to say it's good, but the number is a FICO score, if you know what a FICO score is. It was 660 or above. Now, that's not a great um, uh, credit rating, actually. In fact, the average in the United States is 710, but a 660 was considered a pretty good credit score, plus a 10 to 20 percent down payment for the house and something called a debt-to-income ratio of no more than 38%, which meant after the mortgage was closed, your, all your debts um, were not more than 38% of your annual income. That was all. Those three standards made up a prime mortgage, and that's what Fannie and Freddie insisted on before 1992. In 1992, the government adopted the Affordable Housing Goals, and what you're seeing here is what happened after that. We started this chart in 1996 because by 1996 they'd already been moved up. The Department of Housing and Urban Development was given the authority to adjust these goals. And so by 1996, already the top, let's just look at the top line first. Um, the black line has the affordable housing goals. And as you can see, by 1996, they were 40%. Now, what does that mean? Originally, in the, in the legislation, before HUD was given the authority to increase the goals, the goal was in any year in which Fannie and Freddie bought mortgages, 30% of all of those mortgages had to be made to people who were at or below the median income in the places where they lived, at or below the median income. So it was, the whole policy was to help people of low income buy homes. Great idea, but maybe not this, this may not have been the best way to do it. Um, but what you see here is that by 1996, it was 40%. And by the year 2000, it was 50%. And by the year 2008, it was 56%. So by 2008, 56% of all mortgages that Fannie and Freddie bought had to be made to people who were at or below the median income. Now, as you can understand, it might be difficult to find good quality prime mortgages to people who are below the median income. There's a reason. They don't have steady incomes always. They are, they are subject to all kinds of trouble with jobs and divorces, and, and everyone is, of course, but more so people in the, in below the median income. There were also some sub-goals. One was underserved areas. That was mostly 
minorities, those went up too. And then special affordable goal, that was for people who are 80% or 60% of the median income. That was the third one down. And that also went up, as you can see, it went up from about 12% to about 24% by 2008. So 24% had to be made to, of these mortgages had to have been made to people who were at or below the median income. Fannie and Freddie did not make the mortgages. They just bought them from the lenders, the originators. So what was happening was Fannie and Freddie were saying to them, and Fannie and Freddie, domi when I say they dominated the market, they had about 50% of the market be between them. So they were almost the entire market. And as you know, if you've been in business, you know that if there is a very large market leader, a lot of people follow the, the, the movements of the market leader. And the market leader was, in leaders were Fannie and Freddie, and they were the ones who were telling the originators, give us mortgages from people who are at or below the median income. And in some cases, 60 and 80% of the median income not just simply below 100% of the median income, but much below that. Now what happens if you were subject to that government requirement and you were starting out only making loans that were made, uh, that were prime loans, right? Um, but you're told that you have to keep finding these other loans. Well, there's only one thing you can do under those circumstances. You start to reduce your underwriting standards. I mean, it's simple. I mean, you cannot, not, since you can't find prime mortgages anymore, you start finding subprime mortgages and riskier mortgages. And so by 1995, Fannie and Freddie were accepting mortgages with 3% down payments. Instead of the 10 or 20%, they were accepting 3% down payments. And by the year 2000, they were accepting mortgages with zero down payments. So you can see that there was this tremendous deterioration going on in the mortgage standards in the United States. What did that produce? This is a chart that shows um, the largest housing bubble that we've ever had in the United States, a housing um, uh, price bubble. This is prepared by a professor at Yale by the name of Robert Schiller. And you can see that in about 1979, 1980, we had a little bubble. In 1990, we had a little bubble. But between 1997 and 2007, we had a gigantic bubble, something we'd never seen before, where housing prices were rising about 10% a year. Um, now, you all probably remember that. You were buying houses, selling houses during this period, and it was remarkable. You could buy a house, and the next year it was worth 10% more. And that enabled people to refinance their homes if they couldn't meet their mortgage obligations, right? But let's just talk about why we had a bubble. Now, a lot of, a lot of economists say the reason we had a bubble was because the Fed kept interest rates too low. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm just a lawyer, but uh, th there's something wrong with that because in 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, you remember we had what was called the dot-com bubble at that time. The Fed was actually keeping interest rates high at that point. They weren't lowering interest rates. But the bubble was still growing. And you can see, if you just look at the chart, in about 2003, the bubble was already larger than any bubble we'd ever had. And of course, it just got bigger and bigger. Why would a bubble get larger? Because underwriting standards are declining. Well, think of it this way. If you have $10,000 to buy a house, I know that this doesn't sound right in this area, but just the math is easy, right? Um, if you have $10,000 to buy a house and the underwriting standard is you have to have 10% down payment, you can buy a $100,000 house. You borrow $90,000, you put in your 10, you can buy a $100,000 house. Well, if underwriting standards are reduced so that the underwriting standard is now 5%, you can buy a $200,000 house, right? 
you borrow $190,000, not just $90,000, and you can buy a $200,000 house. Now, anyone who's, anyone who's shopped for a house knows how this works because you, there's always one house in the neighborhood that's beyond what you wanted to pay, but it's nicer. And somehow the agent will tell you, well, if we can get your down payment down to 5%, instead of 10%, then you can actually afford this house. Um, and so, of course, that happened over and over and over again. Two things happen when that occurs. First of all, there's tremendous pressure on housing prices because now there's a lot more what, what we call leverage in the process. Instead of borrowing $90,000 to buy the $100,000 house, the person is borrowing $190,000 to buy a $200,000 house. So there's a lot of leverage pushing up housing prices right there. And the second thing is that the person who does that borrowing is a poorer credit. Because instead of being a person who's now contracted for $90,000 in debt, he or she has now contracted for $190,000 in debt. And that makes the person a much poorer credit under almost all circumstances, above or below the median income, doesn't matter. You are just beginning at that point to become much less credit worthy because you have put a lot more credit, uh, much more liability, much more debt on your personal balance sheet. So that's why we had this tremendous bubble. It was because of the decline in underwriting standards all over the country. And it wasn't just for people who were below the median income because Fannie and Freddie were actually middle class lenders or uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they bought middle class mortgages was a better way to put it. So anyone who was in the middle class above or below the median income didn't matter. When they started reducing their underwriting standards, everybody benefited from that and that's why the bubble rose so high. It wasn't just low-income people, but it was the idea that Fannie and Freddie began to reduce their underwriting standards in order to meet the affordable housing goals that produced the, the problem of uh, underwriting standards all over the country declining very substantially. So we get to 2007, and this is a little picture about what happened in the mortgage-backed securities market. Now, most of you understand that mortgages are made individually. You've, if you've ever bought a house, you've taken out a mortgage. You don't know what happens to your mortgage after that. But what happens to mortgages generally is that they are packaged into pools, and then they are usually sold to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in a pool and Fannie and Freddie will then sell securities in that pool, and anyone who buys a security will get a share of the principal and interest that is paid into the pool by all of the people who made the mortgages. This is, the, this is not showing you Fannie and Freddie. It is showing you what the private mortgage-backed securities market looked like. Fannie and Freddie's market was different because they were backed by the government, so no one worried very much about them. But the 24% that I talked about, remember 76% were on the books of government agencies, the 24% was on the books of the private sector. That's what this tells you about. This is what happened to that market in 2007. And you can see it was a crash. And that's because when the bubble began to deflate, a lot of people started to default on their mortgages. Why? Because before that, as housing prices rose, you were always able to refinance your mortgage. Because in fact, you had a more valuable house. As long as it was going up in value, you could buy a house that for $100,000 in, in 2001, and by 2002, it was worth $110,000. So you could then refinance your mortgages, even if you'd put nothing down. But once the bubble started to collapse, deflate, you couldn't refinance anymore. Your house was actually worth, worth less. And so 
then people had to default, and the defaults were unprecedented. An unprecedented number of defaults were occurring in this country, and that's what, that's what this looks like because the buyers then left the market. They fled. They, they didn't want to touch these mortgage-backed securities anymore because they had no idea how many people were f who, who mortgages were f failing and where those losses were going to actually occur. So they left the market until they got more information. But this tells you something very important, and that is the financial institutions that held these mortgages had to carry, uh, uh, I should say, held these mortgage-backed securities, and many of them were financial institutions, not individuals, but, more, but financial institutions, had to carry those securities at their market value. That was the rule, the accounting rule, that was put in place by something called the account Financial Accounting Standards Board. So if there's no market, what's the value of those securities? The value of those securities is near zero because a market is only where there's a buyer and a seller, and there were no buyers. So all of these financial institutions, banks and others, had to start writing down their mortgage-backed securities, the value of their mortgage-backed securities. And they wrote them down, and they wrote them down, and they wrote them down as the market fell. And that's why you were hearing on the radio and watching television about all of these financial institutions that were in trouble in 2007 and 2008 because they all looked as though they were going bankrupt or they were unstable or they were insolvent. Something was wrong here because they were writing down and taking tremendous losses on their holdings of mortgage-backed securities. Um, now, so what we, what we find out, of course, is that that rule um, was very troublesome. That didn't necessarily mean that the mortgages were actually not paying. Some of them certainly weren't. We know that. And there were many more defaults than we'd ever had. But that didn't mean everyone wasn't paying. And so these write-downs were far greater than they should have been in terms of the effect they had on the financial institutions that were holding the mortgages. And as time went on, people began to notice that the principal and interest on these securities was still flowing in. And people were still paying. Yes, there were a lot of defaults, but most people were still paying on their mortgages. And so the values of those instruments, those mortgage-backed securities, rose again. And so by 2010 and 2011, it's not on this chart, but by 2010 and 2011, they were worth almost as much as they were in 2007. But by then, it was too late because the damage had been done, and we'd been told about toxic mortgages and toxic mortgage-backed securities and the fact that all of these financial institutions had gotten into trouble. And that was where we were told to focus our attention, not on the full picture of why all these mortgages were made and why these financial institutions got into trouble, but rather looking simply at um, the, the institutions themselves and saying, well, that was because the government didn't regulate them sufficiently. The government, I assure you, has all of the regulatory authority it needed in 2008 to regulate these institutions sufficiently, didn't need the Dodd-Frank Act or any additional powers. It had all the powers it needed. The problem was that no one recognized what was happening. No one understood that mortgage underwriting standards had fallen so low that we were sitting on a time bomb in, in the form of low quality mortgages. And one of the reasons for that was that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not telling people, not telling the market or anyone else that they were buying these low-quality mortgages. People still believed that Fannie and Freddie were only buying prime mortgages. Well, there's a lot of worry about these financial institutions, and uh, Wall Street was in big trouble, and we were hearing all of this in the newspapers, and there was a firm on Wall Street by the name of Bear Stearns and Company. Maybe, maybe all of you, some of you remember this name. 
Bear Stearns was in trouble. They had invested very heavily in mortgages. And so um, they, they were the victims from this, and, and as a result of the accounting standards, they had to write down these mortgages, and so they looked like they were going to fail. The government then had a choice. They could let Bear Stearns fail, or they could rescue Bear Stearns. They decided to rescue Bear Stearns. Now, in my view, this was the original sin. This was a major, major error uh, that we have still not fully recovered from. Why was it an error? If you read Hank Paulson's biography, Hank Paulson was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time. This was under George W. Bush. Now, I'm a Republican, you understand. Um, but even Bush made errors, and his, in this case, his Treasury Secretary made an error. Um, he, he believed that if Bear Stearns failed, it would cause a huge convulsion in which all of these large financial institutions would, would fail. There would be a, a worldwide collapse. Okay, so that was his view, uh, and he saved Bear Stearns. Um, there was a $29 billion loan from, from the Federal Reserve, and that helped one of the big banks on Wall Street, um, Chase Bank, to buy um, Bear Stearns. Saved the Bear Stearns creditors. Uh, they all got 100% because they were now creditors of this gigantic bank. Um, and everything went along fairly smoothly after that until September of 2008 when Fannie and Freddie were taken over because they were insolvent. That really scared the market because, as I said, the, no one in the market understood that Fannie and Freddie were actually making poor quality mortgages. They thought that Fannie and Freddie were still buying prime mortgages and only prime mortgages, and they said to themselves, my gosh, if Fannie and Freddie that were buying prime mortgages are going out of business or insolvent, then this is a much worse problem than I ever believed it was. And so they then turned on the market, these investors, and they said, I'm getting out of the next largest uh, uh, firm on Wall Street after Bear Stearns. It was Lehman Brothers. And the market began drawing funds out of Lehman Brothers Everyone who had any money in Lehman Brothers wanted it back, and by the end of the week following the time Fannie and Freddie failed, Lehman Brothers was on the verge of bankruptcy. Now, you have to understand what went on in the heads of the people on Wall Street and investors throughout the country after Bear Stearns was saved. What did they say to themselves? And again, I cannot understand how the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve would not understand this. If I can understand it, they should have been able to understand it. And that is the first thing that people would say to themselves, managers of these big firms, they'd say, well, if the government is going to rescue all of my creditors, then I don't have to raise any large amount of equity in order to reassure my creditors, because they know that if I fail, they'll all be saved. So I'm not going to raise any substantial amount of equity, and because right now the stock market is in the tank, and I will be diluting my shareholders tremendously by raising all this equity, and in any event, it won't make my creditors feel any more comfortable, because they, f they know the government is going to bail them out. So they didn't raise a lot of equity. And by the time we get to September of 2008, when Lehman Brothers is in trouble, Lehman Brothers doesn't have enough equity. And neither does Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or any of these others that had failed to raise tremendous amounts of new equity because they felt their creditors were going to be saved if they ever failed. And they'd just ride out the storm. Things would get better in the future. So that's where we were when Lehman Brothers came to the point where it was near failure. Now, if they saved Lehman Brothers, that would have made a difference, right? Because that's what the market anticipated. And no one had acted in any way that assumed it wouldn't happen. But at that point, 
Hank Paulson lost his nerve. And uh, he told people, I'm not, going to I'm not going to rescue anyone else. They're calling me Mr. Bailout, he told people. They were making fun of me as Mr. Bailout. And so I'm not going to do it. Now, you might wonder whether the Secretary of the Treasury ought to be so concerned about his personal reputation rather than the country as a whole, but that was his decision. And he didn't bail out um, Lehman Brothers, and we know what happened right after that. We had an enormous collapse in the financial market, a panic, because everyone who had assumed that we were going to, uh, that they were going to be protected uh, now did not know at all who was safe and who was not. And we then saw something we had never seen before, and that is the banks on Wall Street, banks anywhere actually, would not lend to one another even overnight. No regulator, no academic, no market participant had ever seen a case where the banks were afraid to lend to one another even overnight. They were hoarding cash in case someone came to them and asked for cash. So that was the financial crisis. And so you now see the, th the three steps that caused the crisis. The first was the affordable housing goals, forcing a reduction in underwriting standards. Then we came to the building of this enormous bubble. We then came to the collapse of the bubble, huge number of losses because of accounting rules. Every one of these financial institutions looked much weaker. Um, looked as though it was insolvent or unstable. And then the government reverses a policy that it established with Bear Stearns and leaves everyone high and dry. That was the financial crisis. And that's what the book, that's the story the book tells. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Peter. Peter has agreed to answer some of your questions. I'd like to start up by asking though, is the student loan bubble the next big financial crisis? Uh, it, it is probably not the, the, sa the same thing because the government is going to be the loser in that case and not any f private financial institutions. It's a crisis for the, sh for the taxpayers. It's not a crisis for, it's of course a crisis for the individual student loan borrowers and for their parents and, and families but it is not a crisis of the kind that we had before. The, uh, the mortgage market is an $11 trillion market. And when that market is distressed or destroyed as it was, um, that is a serious national problem. The student loan market is going to be a problem the taxpayers are going to have to take care of because they don't watch what the government is doing. But it won't destroy our economy. Yes, sir. I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned that the lowering of underwriting standards had to do with down payment. Uh, but the, uh, you mentioned earlier about the debt to income ratio, which yes. of course with the, with the stated income loans and so on, that was, other, that was another issue that was, uh, that was out there. You also mentioned that um, the growth of the economy is the slowest it's ever been because of the, the banks aren't lending anymore. With employment being underrepresented as it is with the government right now, as represented on your graph, is that going to be uh, a, uh, another problem that's out there? Mm -hmm. um, and the other question I have is that the second title of your book is How It Can Happen Again. Yes. And I don't... I ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you right now. Can you, can, you mention, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, let's uh, go to your first question, and that is... This, this graph is where we're going to be, more or less forever, in my view, until we let up the regulations that we have put on the private financial system through the Dodd-Frank Act. So the, those lines are just going to carry out into the future. We are not going to have a beautiful future as long as we keep these regulations in place. And so what I'm really trying to say to the American people when I have a chance to talk to them is if we can get rid of the Dodd-Frank Act or amend it substantially or reform it, we will go back to a, the growth that we had before 
um, we had the Dodd-Frank Act and this financial crisis. And, uh, you know, that'll be 3 or 4% a year. And that will raise everybody's incomes. People will then begin to realize that their children will do better than they do. They did. This is what we all aspire to. This is the American dream. We're not going to have that as long as we have this, this kind of regulation of the financial system. Um, the next question was the government is now doing the same thing that it was doing before the financial crisis, and it is, because just a few months ago, the Federal Housing Administration, which is another government agency, this one controlled directly by the government, it's not just backed by the government like Fannie and Freddie are, that reduced its insurance for FHA loans by about half of 1%. Now, FHA takes very risky mortgages, that's its purpose. It's to take very risky mortgages for people who don't have good credit, but it's supposed to get insurance premiums from those people to match up with the potential losses it's likely to suffer uh, by taking those risky loans. But when you reduce the premium, you're still taking the risky loans. In fact, you're now going to get more of them because more people are going to be able to pay um, or at least qualify for the loans, and you're going to suffer more lo losses in the future. So more and more poor quality loans are flowing into our financial system right now. The, the regulator of Fannie and Freddie, the so-called Federal Housing Finance Agency, told them about six months ago, you're not taking enough risks. You are insisting on 5% down payments. That's already too low, you understand. It used to be 10 to 20%. You're insisting on 5% down payments. I want you to start taking loans with 3% down payments. So you can see what's going on here. Why? Because the government has an incentive to do this. When they reduce underwriting standards, the housing market grows. You eventually get a bubble, but it starts to grow. People are happier. People are buying rugs. They're buying furniture. They're contracting for gardening services. The economy is doing a little bit better. But it's a very short-term process. And the reason that the government is doing this is because it's in the government's interest to do it, and the American people do not understand what caused the crisis in the first place. We have a question in the third row. Good evening. Uh, my question is, in the early 90s, uh, I believe it was in the 90s, under Clinton, the uh, financial industries like banks could start selling insurance and securities. Uh, stock uh, financial firms like or like Merrill Lynch, they could start. They were started a bank, and they were selling insurance, and they were selling mortgages. Do you think that had any effect on this uh, crisis? No, I don't think it had anything to do with this crisis. Um, the banks and others got into trouble because they held these mortgages, not because they sold them, or they held the mortgages or the mortgage-backed securities. Um, the fact that the, bank, the banks could always sell mortgage-backed securities, they could always buy and sell mortgages. Um, the trouble is that there were too many low-quality mortgages available at this time because of the collapse of underwriting standards. So it wasn't the other things that banks were able to do, or non-banks like Merrill were able to get into insurance or able to get into um, other financial activities. That isn't what caused the problem. The problem was the, all of the poor quality mortgages that were flowing into our financial system. So I, I don't think any of that so-called deregulation that occurred um, made any difference. Or it, the same thing would have happened if that deregulation hadn't occurred because all of them would have been in the same, doing the same thing that they were doing during the financial crisis period. Hi there. Hi. Senators Frank Dodd and Senator Barney Frank, during the time period when they were trying to get this legislation through, by the way, they did retire right after that. They right. didn't run again. Right. And they announced they weren't going to run again. Right. Because they knew it was a bad deal. So I'm sorry I didn't read your book, and you probably covered this in your book, but I do remember Mr. Frank especially on our TV programs, every single week, sometimes three and four times a week, 
pushing this legislation. And didn't they, didn't one of them, I think Mr. Frank, sit on one of these boards of either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or <laughs> something like that because he knew an awful lot about it. Yeah. And I know you said that they didn't know what was going on, but he sure talked about it every night. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I don't know what they actually knew, um, but uh, they were wrong. But they were, this is, their, this is their ideological approach to things. They wanted the government to provide these benefits to people, and they were blind to what the consequences would be. I have to say that in terms of Barney Frank, after he had retired, he went on a television show. I happened to be on the same television show at the same time, and he said it was a huge mistake to do what we did after he'd retired, after he'd gotten his name on the bill. Um, and uh, both of them have never yet, though, been blamed fully as they should be by the American people for what they did. The people who are blamed are the people in the private sector, you know? But these two guys, they get their name on a famous bill and they're scot-free. We have a question in the third row. Could you... Uh, reiterate what you said about the uh, Dodd-Frank uh, and the connection with the housing bubble. I didn't quite get the connection. Yeah, as Dodd-Frank is a result of the, the narrative, the, the argument that the financial crisis was caused by uh, an insufficient regulation of the private sector. And so if you believe that the private sector isn't being sufficiently regulated, and that was the argument the, the people in Congress, like Nancy Pelosi, wanted to make, then you, you would adopt very tough regulation of the financial system, and you wouldn't worry about what the government had done to cause the financial crisis, and that's where we are. People do not understand that it was the government's housing policies that caused the crisis. What they believe mostly, because they've heard it from the government and they've heard it from the media, is that the banks were reckless and irresponsible and created this crisis and so should be more heavily regulated. We have a question in the second row. Have any of the current presidential candidates taken a position on Dodd-Frank? Um, yes, actually, but, you know, just statements, not long statements about it. And I doubt that you'll hear much in the campaign, but I know Marco Rubio said, actually in one of the debates, said that Dodd-Frank was a catastrophe and would have to be reformed. Um, but that was the only one I can remember saying that in, in the debate. I did have some time to talk with one of the candidates who's now dropped out, Scott Walker, and he was also of that view, but his, he's, he's pulled his name out of contention. Uh, but I think all of them understand, the Republican candidates understand that um, if they're going to have prosperity, if they become president, they're going to have to do something very serious about the Dodd-Frank Act. I don't think any of the Democrats who are running are even considering such a thing. We have a question in the third row. Been interested in what you've been saying regarding regulation. It doesn't seem that there was any regulation. You can't. I have a hard time <coughs> believing that Fannie Mae and Fannie Mac could go on for as long as they did buying this stuff without somebody being aware of it. Well, I can't believe that Goldman Sachs and others jumped into this thing unknowing of what was being done. Uh, they can't be that dumb. My feeling is, very frankly, you didn't discuss greed, and I think greed had a hell of a Well, I, I, I would certainly never contend that there isn't any greed. Greed has been with us for, well, as long as there have been human beings. But, um, it, and it is, of course, hard to believe that they didn't know this, but it is possible if you believe that this is headed for a crash and these are all terrible investments. It's possible to bet against them and make a fortune. And nobody did. Well, I won't say nobody, but very, very few people did. You might have read the book, um, The Big Short, by Michael Lewis. Michael Lewis talks about people who thought that it was all going to come crashing down. 
and went around Wall Street trying to get people to buy from them the bets against the, what was going on in the housing market, and people were telling them, there's not going to be a crash. You, you're wrong. We've never had a loss of more than 3 or 4 percent ever in history in the housing market, and that was true. No one really understood at this time that we could have a crash of this size. And also, as I mentioned, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac never disclosed the poor quality of the mortgages that they were buying, so people didn't understand, even at the Federal Reserve didn't understand how many mortgages, poor quality mortgages were outstanding. In the book, I make the point that Ben Bernanke, who was the chairman of the Fed, the Fed has an un limited number of very smart economists working for it, um, was telling Congress and telling the American people there can't be any problem here because there are only about six, six million, maybe seven million subprime loans outstanding. At the time he was saying that, there were about 18 million subprime loans outstanding. He didn't know. And so, you know, it, I know it's hard to believe that people didn't understand what was ha happening, but there are ways to rationalize these things to yourself, and there are ways that you could uh, see the economy, uh, look at it, and say, well, maybe things uh, are not that bad. Maybe, maybe all of these subprime mortgages are not such bad um, uh, investments. And, and people were making up things, for example. People were saying, you know, now we use computers to analyze these mortgages. And so we're much more careful than we were before. Yes, they're subprime by older standards, but, we, but because of data processing, we know so much more that they're really safe. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were those who were saying that their computerized modeling made it much safer for whatever they were doing and what the rest of the economy was doing. So, I don't want to excuse anyone here, and I know it's hard to believe, but if, if it was in fact widespread knowledge on Wall Street that things were going to come crashing down, they could have made a fortune betting against what was happening in the market, and people weren't doing it. I have a question in the second row. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to let you know I'm one of the few people who read your dissent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, uh, and I appreciate Thank your courage you. in, in doing that. We need more people like, uh, like you and what you do. Thank you. But uh, the uh, Dodd-Frank, what aspects of Dodd-Frank uh, is doing the most damage right now? So that if it's reformed, uh, would do the most good? Um, <clears throat> there are several things that, that Dodd-Frank has in it that are really troublesome. One is the so-called Volcker Rule. Uh, the Volcker Rule uh, prevents banks from buying and selling um, debt securities for their own accounts. That's something banks had always been able to do. It forbids them to do that. So there's very little capital now uh, trading in the markets. You know, in the, in the equity markets, there's a lot of liquidity because a lot of people own shares and they trade shares back and forth. In the debt markets, there isn't very much liquidity at all. And <clears throat> if you want to sell a bond, if you're an, uh, an institutional investor, you want to sell a bond, you have to find someone to buy it. You, you can't go to an exchange and just find people there bidding for it. Um, so unless you have a lot of people with capital buying and selling, you can't get rid of your bond, and it's much more expensive also to buy one because you have to find someone who is willing to sell you one if you want it. That rule has made it extremely hard for people to liquidate their assets, and that has had a major adverse effect on people. The, the, what is called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has a wonderful name. It's protecting consumers, but what it is actually doing is imposing huge costs on small banks. The big banks have no problems because they have huge staffs of lawyers who can take care of all these rules. But one rule that the community, uh, that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau put out on one issue was a thousand pages. And if you're a, if you're a, a small banker, um, what are you supposed to do with a thousand page rule? And you've got to abide by that rule or they're gonna, you're gonna be put out of business by the regulators. So everyone has pulled back from making credit available or taking risks in making loans to small business, for example. And small business 
is what really drives the growth of our economy. It's the people at the grassroots, the 28 million mom and pops we have in this country, the 5 million people, 5 million businesses that have less than 500 employees. Those are the people who are really making this economy go under norm normal circumstances, and the data shows that they're not growing at all. The ones that have access to the capital markets and can borrow in the capital markets because they've registered their securities with the Securities and Exchange Commission, they're doing pretty well, actually. But it's the ones that really cause this economy to grow that are subject to all these regulations and um, have been hiring people to help them comply with the regulations rather than people who will make loans. It's as simple as that. We have another question towards the back row. Where are we here? Ah, OK. Uh, thank you. I've been in the mortgage business, or was. I just closed our company out in December for 52 years. I've seen this ride through, this cycle ride through from 1959 with the rising rate market up till 1981 and 82, and then the slow decline down. If you'll think back to preface all of this, in 1990, when, uh, in 91, we had a recession going on. Uh, in the period of the 90s, uh, we saw people that didn't, had never owned a home were not building any equity and therefore they were destined to stay poor because you need to have capital to grow capital and, and pensions and so on. So the whole idea behind Congress was to move from 57% of people in home ownership in the country to something over closer to 65 to even 70. That was the objective that right. Congress made. Today, that number's <coughs> back down to 57 or even under. Uh, excuse me, uh, 47, back, no, 57, 57.6. The reason, the attempt was a good thing to try to help people build their own personal estates and become self-reliant on their own assets to retire as middle income or higher. That's right. The problem with it was that when you underwrite credit, those who are capable of underwriting credit are just as expert, have to be just as expertise as any banker on understanding risk. And when risk is rules are thrown away by government regulation, which was done here, then the people who generate the loans say, we aren't in the decision process any longer. And the best part is, I only have to own that loan for about 30 days until right. I collect enough pool, then I can sell it. And so I'm out from under it. Now, the, quest, the, the point here that I want to make in my, is that uh, had we had a market where the underwriters themselves could have said, here's the risk, you shouldn't, these people can't afford it. 38% of your income, toward total income, is for all debt payments. You said debts earlier, you meant debt payments. You can't make it with food costs going up, automobile taxes, so forth. So, the bottom line I want to make here is that when you take the private enterprise out of the underwriting business and no one is accountable any longer for the long-term risk, you're peddling off bad debts to an institution that has set rules and regulations from the, the uh, Senate Banking Committee right down through. And here we are, stuck right. with a situation where government regulation has created this bubble of, of housing, and we're still doing it, right? With the with the student loan as well as the as well as the auto loans, right? <laughs> you sounds like you read the book. <laughs> Good, but I agree with everything you said. That's true, except for one just small data point, and that is the the home ownership rate in the United States was 64 percent between 1965 and 1995, went up after 1995 because of the policies to almost 70%. Everyone in Washington was thrilled by that. 64%. Yep. Yeah, that's right, but you, you got the, the idea perfectly well. But, you know, people in Washington were thrilled. They didn't want to know what was happening. They just wanted to know that more people were owning homes because that's good for the politicians. But it was a catastrophe that was in the making. 
We have time for one more question. I want to let everyone know that uh, Peter will be available in the lobby to sign your books, so uh, please stop by uh, after, uh, after this. So um, I remember you said that people didn't know what was going on. I remember that in 1999, the New York Times, which is not a liberal paper, wrote an editorial about this mess and said it will be a catastrophe at some point in the future. And I also remember congressmen, and I don't remember the names of congressmen, but there were congressmen saying that this was going to be a catastrophe, yeah. and Maxine <coughs> Waters and Bonnie Frank, especially Maxine Waters, were saying, you're only saying, uh, you, you're only saying that you need to make high, higher standards for mortgages because uh, you're racist, it only affects minority people. So people did know about it. And well, it just, no, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean people knew about it. People, people thought that it was going to collapse in the future, and I thought it was going to collapse in the future. But the only way you really know that people think it is going to collapse in the future is when they put their money behind uh, bets against this market continuing. Because anyone can say, we're going to have a catastrophe down the road, um, but they're just talking. Part of the research I did for this book was to go into the internet, the internet is a wonderful resource, as all of you know, to try to find anyone before the crisis who said, with any kind of data, that we're going to have a crisis. Um, and there was no one. There were lots of people who said, things can't go on this way. But they didn't have any data. Um, so I. You know, there are always people who warn against things, just as there are people who are always out there saying, everything's fine, it's going to go, it's going to be great in the future. Um, that's not what we should lo be looking for. I look for people who bet, who put their money on the line when they say it's going to go to hell. Yeah, well, one guy. One, that's right. He made a fortune, too. Thank you very much, Peter. Please give Peter Wallace and bring him around to applause. Again, Peter will be available in the lobby. Uh, please check back for future events at nixonfoundation.org. Have a good evening.